Good morning, friends. We find ourselves at the end of a teaching session on the Sabbath. But I believe it's not the end of us practicing the Sabbath. It's only the beginning. And I believe there's major ways in which God wants us to grow as a, as a local church as we grow into, into the Sabbath. And, and I'm so excited as I hear testimonies of people um, trying to, starting to implement these things on the Sabbath and finding much joy and much fulfillment in it. May I ask you the question, what is your Sabbath like? Well, for many Christians, I'm guessing it's on a Sunday. It's probably the best day of the week for most people, to Sabbath. But here's what a Sunday looks like in general. In the Western world and especially in South Africa. You stay up late Saturday night. You watch the rugby or soccer. You eat too much. You may drink too much. You go to a party. You wake up Sunday morning tired. You rush out the door, hurry to church. If you go to church. More and more people don't go to church. After church you go shopping. Or watch a game or Formula One on TV. You work around the house. You prepare a meal. You clean up the yard. You plan for your week. Do homework. Study for exams. Watch a movie. Go to bed. Friends, that is not the Sabbath. And I'm not saying that with even a hint of judgment. Please don't feel any shame. It's just an honest appraisal. That is not a Sabbath. <laughs> that is what Eugene Peterson calls a bastard Sabbath. An unacknowledged, the unacknowledged offspring of the ancient practice of the way of Sabbath. And a modern secular day off. It's what people that has been practicing Sabbath call a Sabbish. It's kind of like a Sabbath. But it's not. It's just a Sabbish. How do we feel, how do we keep the Sabbath? From becoming a savage. From becoming just another activity on the weekend. We've said through this entire practice. There's four movements to the Sabbath. To stop. To rest. To delight. And to worship. Today we're taking a look at worship. And this is probably the most important session. So keep your ears open where does this idea come from? Let's take a look at the Word of God. Page to Genesis 2. I hope it's highlighted and underlined by now. By the seventh day, God has finished the work He had been doing. So on the seventh day, He rested from all His work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it He rested from all the work of creating He had done. Notice God did two things on the Sabbath. First, He blessed the Sabbath day. Now, we, Theo spoke about it last week, but this, this word bless means to make happy. God made the Sabbath happy. The Sabbath is a happy day. But as God blessed in Genesis, this is a life-giving capacity He gives to the animals of the sea, of the land, of the air, and of human beings. He blessed them to fill the earth with more life. The Sabbath is blessed. It is life-giving. God blessed the Sabbath. But secondly, God made it holy. So holy sounds very religious. But stay with me because it's fascinating. In the ancient, ancient worlds, gods were found in the world of space. Gods were found 
on holy mountains, in holy caves, or in holy temples. We would expect that God would make a holy place, but God didn't. God made a holy day. Abraham Heschel called Sabbath the architecture in time and said, Sabbath, Sabbaths are our great cathedrals because for this God, the one true creator God, the entire cosmos is his temple. There's no nowhere he's not. So if you want to find this God, our God, you don't need to climb a mountain or travel to a shrine. He's all around you. You just need to set aside the time to come awake and alive to His presence. But what exactly does it mean to make a day holy? In Hebrew, the word holy is kwadosh. It literally means unique or special or uncommon. The theological meaning says God it's set aside for God's special purposes. We tend to think that, that holy is a moral description. Is a descriptor. A way of saying something or someone is good or evil. And in a sense it is. But contrary to our humanistic culture view, goodness or what ancient calls virtue has always been a minority in the society as a whole. Jesus said, Wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, in Matthew 7 verse 30, and goes on. He says, Many will enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The narrow way of Jesus is holy. It is uncommon goodness. But holiness is more than just a moral world. In the Torah there is holy pots and holy pans and holy utensils for the tabernacle. A fork or knife can't be good or evil. But it can be set apart for God's special purposes or used for normal life. Growing up, I remember my, my mom had a tea set that was set apart. And we had small wine glasses that were set apart. I don't remember ever drinking out of that tea set. But I remember drinking out of those small glasses. It usually happened at Christmas Eve. That my dad will give us all a little bit of, of sweet wine. And uh, we'll have that for, for Christmas Eve. And then that glasses would be very carefully washed. And put away until the next um, Christmas Eve. Now that tea set and that glasses. I, I think it was crystal. Um, but it might not have been. Um, it was holy. It was set apart for, for our family's special purpose. It was not used for daily life. But what those small glasses was for ordinary glasses, the Sabbath is to the rest of the week. It's set apart. But set apart for what? Or better said, for who? Let's read from Exodus 16, verse 23. Moses said to him then, This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, He gives you bread for two days. So the people rested on the seventh day. Notice the phrase, 
a holy Sabbath to the Lord, can also be translated being set apart to the Lord or dedicated to the Lord. The Sabbath is an entire day that is set aside not just for rest and celebration or delight, but for God. To put it another way, it's a day of worship. When we hear worship, we think of singing, and that's a good example of worship. But there's so much more. In the biblical sense, to worship is to orient or to reorient your entire life around God, our Creator, our Center. It is to lay your entire life before Him in love and to deepen our surrender to His love. One way to do this through worship by singing. But there's so many more ways. Giving our time, giving our resources, our attention, our affection to God. Yielding our will to God. Anything we do to center God, to direct our hearts in love to His glory, His goodness, is a form of worship. Yes, it's a day to stop and refill our tanks. Yes, it's a day to delight, to celebrate. But above all, it's to contemplate the good news that God has given <coughs> It's a day to contemplate the good news that God has given His life to us in Jesus. And now it is our joy to give our lives in worship back to Him. It's to deepen our commune with the deepest reality there is. Our God. Friends, this is the final and most important movement of Sabbath. Worship. I see there's a progression in my life, in my experience, as, as we've started to, to practice this Sabbath. I've stopped, I've rested, then as my energy comes back, I begin to delight. And as I delight, I almost can't help but burst into spontaneous worship and gratitude and praise and wonder and awe at the goodness of God. By the end of the the Sabbath, I often look up into the sky or look onto the sea and I cannot help but saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Ruth Barton, in a chapter on Sabbath in the book Sacred Rhythms, writes, I know what it's like to rest for hours until I have the energy to delight in something. Good food, a good book, a leisurely walk, a long-awaited conversation with someone I love. I know what it's like to feel joy and hope and peace flow back into my life, my body and my soul. I'd thought it might never come back again. I know what it's like to see my home and my children through the Sabbath eyes of enjoyment. I know what it's like to have rest turn into delight. Delight turn into gratitude, and gratitude turn into worship. This is one of the many reasons for most of us. Sundays is by far the best day to Sabbath. Friends, for thousands, for a thousand years, Sabbath and Sunday worship were synonymous. Only recently, they were separated. But they go together. In a tragic way, the Sabbath has been co-opted by the weekend. From a day of worship to a day off. It goes to the heart of the matter. Sabbath is holy, but you have to keep it holy. The Ten Commandments we read in Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. The Jews don't talk about practicing the Sabbath. They keep the Sabbath, mean they keep it holy. They call it a sanctifying day, a set-apart day, treating it special and unique. You see, we either 
sanctify the Sabbath and keep it holy, or we can, in the language of Scripture, profane the Sabbath, meaning we can devalue it, dishonor it, treat it like just another day for doing as we please. What about you? Do you keep the Sabbath holy? Do you profane it? What about me? Because ultimately, this is about, it's not about the day. This is about your life. Remember all practices. It's just a means to an end. The Sabbath is a day of worship by which we cultivate a spirit of worship in all the days of our lives. Is your whole life holy? Is your life set apart and dedicated to God? An uncommon goodness? Or is it profane? Common? Following the broad path that's all around you? Friends, my aim here is not to put a guilt trip on you. Going to church more, doing more spiritual disciplines. It's to drive home that the Sabbath is of life and death importance. Followers of Jesus disagree on whether the Sabbath is still a binding command. But friends, whoever's right or wrong doesn't matter. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And all the commandments of Scripture, but especially the Ten, are put to guard us. From death and lead us to life. Moses said in the commandments in Deuteronomy as he ended off he said I, today I put before you life or death. Choose this day. What will you choose? Keeping the Sabbath is arguably just as important as not lying, stealing or killing. It is of life and death importance. Our culture is killing itself through overwork, overconsumption, overactivity. We are, as Neil Postman says, amusing ourselves to death. Few things are as desperately needed today as recovering the ancient practice of Sabbath. Sabbath is means. By which we enter into what Jesus called the kingdom or reign of God. It is a day when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Theologian point out that Sabbath looked both backwards and forwards in time. It's an aftertaste of the Garden of Eden and a foretaste of the new Jerusalem. When we gather for Sabbath around the table with a multi-ethnic family of God, not just friends, but brothers and sisters, bound around Jesus Christ, bound together. Jesus Christ, our host and honored guest, we eat bread, we drink wine, we give thanks, we sing, we love, we dance, we celebrate. We revel in a sense that all is well. Friends, this is not just a sign of salvation. This is salvation. <coughs> I love that in a sense, on the Sabbath, we're practicing for eternity. Again, Abraham Rachel said, Unless one learns how to relish the taste of Sabbath while still in this world, unless one is initiated into the appreciation of eternal life, one will be unable to taste eternity in the world to come. The essence of the world to come is Sabbath eternal. And the seventh day is a time, in time is an example of eternity. What makes the Sabbath just a joy is not just good food around the table with family and friends. It's not just time off from work and time to delight. It is God Himself. The Trinity community at the center of the unity who radiates joy. 
He is what we crave for deep in our beings. Whether we put the name of God to our ache or misdiagnose our desire for God as a desire for something else. The danger of last week's teaching on the Sabbath as the light is that with all ideas the enemy is constantly at work to wrap good ideas from reality to parody. We can easily be confused in our hedonistic culture into confusing a God word day into a self-centered day of pleasure. Anyone who's ever tasted true delight as the Creator intended for the creation know that there's a chasm of difference between delight and hedonism or simple pleasure. Delight is meant to draw your whole being to God in gratitude and joy. Pleasure is just trying to make your body feel good. You don't walk away from pleasure feeling profound gratitude. You just walk away wanting more pleasure. But this, the, there is a kind of delight that is virtually indistinguishable from worship. Dan Alexander said this, For six days I wrestle in a world under the toil of the curse, soiled by the oil of humanity's commerce, deeply longing for the bright wings of the coming dawn, and each day is at best is a repetition of the day before, unless the next day is the Sabbath. It is the queen of all days, the day in which the vision Destitution and death are put aside to celebrate our union with God, the abundance of His love, the wild hope of the coming kingdom. It is a day of holy fiction, a day when the promise of God is fulfilled on the stage where we write the scripts and take the roles we want to act for His glory. In other words, the Sabbath is a day of worship. Social critic David Foster Wallace made in a famous commencement address the following notes about worship. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshipping. Everybody worship. There is only a choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, you will never have enough. Never, never feel you have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you'll always feel ugly. And when the time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally blot you. Worship power, you will feel weak and afraid. You will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect. Being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud. Always on the verge of being found out. And so on. Look. The insidious thing about all these things of worship. Is not that they are evil or sinful. It's that they are unconscious. They are default set things. They are the kind of worship you just gradually slip into. Day after day. To put it in another way. The question, question isn't, do you worship? It's who or what do you worship? And if we become like who we are, if we become like who or what we worship, as wisdom tradition has long said, that then what kind of person is this worship forming you into? You will worship something. You will orientate your life around something. Put your faith, your hope, your love into something. Find your identity, communion, your, your, your community, your sense of meaning and purpose in something. You'll pursue it, sacrifice for it, discipline yourself for it, 
The question is simply what? Or rather who? <coughs> and no, no, no matter how good or noble, noble a pursuit is, the moment we elevate created things to a place reserved for the Creator, we immediately ruin it. And in doing so, we ruin ourselves. Because nothing can bear the weight of our worship other than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Friends, the Sabbath is a day for worship. All week long, the false gods of this world lure us out of our orbit around God in a kind of gravitational decay. Invisible, yet powerful, pulling us down. They all promise us a rest. And the sense of joy and satisfaction and identity and community and so forth. Yet, all they give us is incessant weariness and an emptiness of the soul. This western world has a home to perfection. On the Sabbath we come back to our holy center in God. This point deep within all of us. It's who we've been baptized into, where we are in Christ, where our spirit is in communion with His Spirit, where we're not even sure who's who anymore, where we draw on the life at the heart of the Trinity itself and give our life back in return. The Sabbath is a day of worship. I invite you, worship. The only one that's worthy, our Lord, our God, and Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you've set aside, blessed, made holy a day. And Lord God, that you have commanded us keep it. Not because you need it, Lord God, but because we need it. And Lord God, I pray for, for people that is struggling to see the relevance or the goodness of it. Lord, I pray that they may taste and see. Lord, I pray for those of us who have started practicing your way, Lord God, who has felt uh, challenged, who has failed, Lord. Lord, that we won't give up. That we will continue to walk in your ways. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I encourage you to, to worship with us. As we, as we sing this song, praise is rising. And may we command our hearts and souls to look to the one who gave his life for us. Have a blessed day. Is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you, hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away.
face the day And in your presence all our fears are washed away When we see, it's when we see you We find strength to face the day And in your presence all our fears are washed away Washed away 